Hello there. I am Ed Harrison. I am the pinch hitter here, talking to Brent Johnson here of Santiago Capital. Uh, our our uh, the main batter, uh, Max uh, Weathy, he had a power outage throughout his entire neighborhood, and uh, I've been uh, put on, you know, to uh, to pinch hit for him. Uh, Brent, great to talk to you. Uh, thanks for having me. Always happy to talk to Real Vision. You know, uh, you, I think that Max, you were just telling me right before I came on that Max was talking to you before I got on about what you guys do before his power went out and why the dollar is important within that context. Can you give us a little bit of information about uh, sure. what you guys do? Yeah, so so, so I'm, I have a wealth management firm called Santiago Capital in San Francisco. Uh, we manage a little under $140 million, uh, and that's spread across about you know 15 to 20 clients, depending on how you break it down. There's a number of family members uh, that are part of the same family in, in some of the accounts. Um, so it's a fairly concentrated uh, business by number of clients, uh, but it's very diversified by you know kind of the different businesses they do. So nobody does the same thing. You know, some of them have a big individual stock position. Some of them own a private company. Some of them are retired. But really what we try to do is kind of work with them on the assets that they have, kind of the goals that they have, the needs that they have, and kind of come up with an overall comprehensive wealth management plan, for lack of a better word, where we coordinate with their, you know, trust and estate lawyers and their CPA. So really comprehensive wealth management. And, you know, because everybody's different and everybody has different goals, you know, we don't have model portfolio. So not everybody has the same portfolio. Um, you know, what we try to do is look at their overall big picture, figure out where the holes are. And, uh, you know, if there's a hole, then we try to, you know, plug that hole or try to provide uh, advice and uh, execution to, to fill that hole. And then, you know, we also manage uh, the rest of their portfolios as well. But then we'll, t we'll also take into account the assets that we don't manage. So some of them have big real estate holdings. Maybe some of them have, you know, a big venture capital distributor or allocation. Um, but w where, where it really gets interesting is that while everybody's, in di everybody's different, everybody lives in the same world. And the, why that's important is because I believe and, and where we kind of think that we have an advantage or an edge is that we have a pretty good understanding of how the monetary system works. And we believe that based on the design of the monetary system and some of the stuff we're going to talk about later today, that the dollar is going to be the primary driver of asset returns going forward over the next two or three years. And when I say asset returns, I don't just mean stocks or bonds. I mean all global asset prices we think are going to be heavily influenced on what happens with the dollar. And so uh, we think that there, if anybody that's heard me talk before knows that I think the dollar is going to get a lot stronger. We think that there's going to be a currency crisis. And so in our separately managed account business, um, where we do these customized portfolios for individuals, we're largely trying to protect against these problems that we see coming uh, over the next couple of years. Now, in addition to those separately managed accounts, uh, in partnership with my friend Keith Dicker of Isacap Asset Management, I co-manage a private fund that is really focused on profiting from some of this chaos that we see coming. And it's a way, and, and we use this as a hedge against the separately managed account business and clients' overall portfolios. And that 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 fund has about seventeen million dollars in it. So you know, neither of these uh, these businesses are huge businesses, uh, but they're big enough that that uh, you know that, that we have access to some pretty sophisticated trades and some pretty sophisticated uh, options. And we kind of bring the combination of the separately managed account, the holistic approach the understanding of the, the monetary system, and then using this fund as kind of a hedge or kind of an alpha generator um, uh, to, to, to help offset any problems in the, in the rest. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important, is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. The portfolio uh, to kind of come up with an overall solution for clients. And so when people hear me talk, I always talk about the dollar, but we do much more than, than just the dollar. We just happen to think that the dollar is the primary driver right now. And someday the dollar won't be the primary driver and, we'll, and we won't have to talk about it anymore. 
Uh, but nothing has changed in the last few years that tells me I need to take my eye off the ball here because we still think that it is the primary determinant going forward. So, you know, what, I, what I've done today is I put together a number of different slides and I apologize for, you know, the quality of some of them. I wasn't sure if we were actually going to walk through them live or if, if we were just going to put them up later. But um, I think it kind of helps set the stage for, for why I think the dollar is so important and, and why, um, you know, why an allocation to a strategy that, that will help protect against this and perhaps benefit from it is important. Um, so, so in the yeah, overall let's, context, let's go yeah, through that, yeah, uh, yeah, that yeah. deck, the, the, the uh, slides that you sent, maybe we can just go through it in order. I, I see 17 total, you know, yeah. you can flip through them at whatever pace you want. I'm going to interject with my own questions and then have some questions from people within the audience as well. Okay, great. So the first thing I'm going to say, um, and, and I, it's pretty funny because this whole dollar milkshake theory has kind of taken on a life of its own. And it, it, I didn't call it that initially with, with the anticipation of this happening, but it, but it has become kind of a, kind of a thing that, that, that people reference. And the first thing I want to point out is that I called it the dollar milkshake theory. I didn't call it the dollar milkshake fact. I didn't call it the the, the dollar milkshake ultimatum or, <laughs> or, 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 or you know, it, it's it, it's an idea that I have. It, 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 it's a framework that I see the market playing out over the next couple of years. But I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Nobody knows what, exactly what's going to happen. You know, the dollar bulls don't know exactly what's going to happen. The dollar bears don't know exactly what's going to happen. You know, even, uh, you know, George Soros doesn't know exactly what's going to happen. And so um, why I think it's important to look at this and consider, though, this is that if I am right, and I might not be, but if I am right, it has huge implications for a portfolio. And as a fiduciary, if I see something that has huge implications, I can't ignore it. I can, you know, I can, I can, I can analyze it. I can either place assets in front of it or behind it or, or to hedge off of it, but, but I can't ignore it. And that's why, you know, that's why I talk about the dollar so much. And so as I walk through these slides, keep that in mind that this is a framework. Um, and so what I did, the first slide I put up here is it basically shows the U.S. dollar um, and anchor currencies around the world, and 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 what the what where the dollar was an anchor currency back in 1950 versus where it is today, or th this chart is actually from 2015, so it's a few years old. But the point I want to make is 50 years ago, or 60, 70 years ago, the dollar was already the dominant currency. But in the last 50, or actually in the last 30 or 40 years, you know, you've heard a lot about de-dollarization. In the last 10 or 20 years, you've heard a lot more about de-dollarization. In the last two years, you hear about it all the time. But the reality is, is that the dollar's gotten stronger over that time period. The dollar dominates the global currency markets more today than it did 50, 60, 70 years ago. So the idea that you know the dollar is not an even if you hate the dollar the idea that the dollar is not an important factor I think should be absolutely be thrown out the window it's a huge factor regardless of which side you come down on it and part of the reason that it's become so important if we go to the next slide mm -hmm. is is that there's actually two different dollar markets um, there is the U S domestic dollar market. And then there's the euro dollar market. The euro dollar market should not be confused with the euro market. Euros are the currency from you know the, the, the European Central Bank and the European Union. The euro dollar market basically refers to dollars that exist outside the United States. And there is a huge, huge market of dollars outside the United States. And this chart here kind of shows um, that the that the onshore US dollar domestic market and the offshore US or the offshore dollar market are roughly the same size. And I, and I think the argument could be made that the offshore market, because it's so opaque, because it can't really be measured, because there's so many different tentacles, it's like a spider's web. Uh, I, I would actually argue that the offshore market is, is bigger than the, than the onshore market. And then it shows, um, below that, it shows some of the other currencies and their domestic markets versus their offshore markets. And the point I want to make here um, because I think one of the things when people analyze the dollar they get into trouble with is they, they analyze the supply of new dollars that are being created by the Fed, and they forget about the demand for dollars. And, and, and then they also don't look at the same dynamic taking place with other currencies that are being printed by their uh, central banks. And so if you look at this chart, 
you know, the, the dark blue is kind of the size of the domestic markets, and the light blue is kind of the size of the offshore markets for all these different currencies. Well, well the dollar is clearly the biggest currency market. And then the offshore dollar market not only is as big, if not bigger, than the U.S. onshore dollar market, it's it's almost as big as any other market, both onshore and offshore. Right. So, so the offshore dollar market, it's, it's just a huge market. It just is. And by um, the so, way, you know, as you say that, uh, one thing that comes to mind to me is I think about fiat currencies and I think about Bretton Woods and the gold standard. And in a sense, you could say that in a fiat currency world, that the the role that gold might have played in the gold standard or in Bretton Woods is now played by the dollar. That is, is that the dollar was pegged to gold in Bretton Woods, and now everything else is pegged to the dollar. Exactly. And, you know, I'll, I'll say this right here. I am a huge fan of gold. And people have heard me talk about gold before. I think gold should be the cornerstone of everybody's portfolio. Gold is going to go to $5,000 and probably a lot higher than that. Whether it happens today or tomorrow or five years from now, I don't know, but I think gold should be an important part of the market. But don't let your understanding of gold blind you from the fact that we are now on a dollar standard. The right. world runs on a dollar standard. Like it or hate it. I wish it wasn't this way, but it is. And so to your point, it's important to kind of look at it, look at the dollar as gold was, you know, 100 years ago, so to speak. And if, if you go to the next slide, where it starts to get even more complicated is now you have, you know, the, the onshore, these are just different, uh, you know, it's broken down between the onshore market and the offshore market of dollars. And it kind of shows the progression. And what I think is important to understand is it's not only become a dollar market in the U.S. and a dollar market outside the U.S., but all of these different, you know, shadow markets and, you know, money market funds and repos and, um, you know, special purpose vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. So not only has the, 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 the euro dollar market grown, but the complexity and the opaqueness and the it's just kind of become this monster that nobody really has their arms around. Right. And so the so so when people tell me that the Fed has it all under control or the Fed will be able to bail it out or the Fed all the Fed has to do is you know hit the print button you know the money printer go burn and it's all taken care of, I think they're I just think they're completely off base because I don't think the Fed has any clue what they're dealing with or they might have a clue but I don't think they have any clue as to how to deal with it. And so while I have no doubt that they will try. I think it's going to be much harder for them to do it than many other people think it is. So th that that kind of sets up the overall context of why I think the dollar is so important. Uh, if you go to the next slide, this kind of shows the dollar dominance in a number of different factors, and it shows that how you know the the, the dollar is the yellow bar, um, then you get the euro, the the yuan, and the yen. And it's pretty obvious just by looking at this that you know whether you're talking about foreign exchange reserves, international debt, loans, foreign exchange turnover. A global payments and global trade invoicing um, that the dollar is dominant. Now, right. there's something there, there's something I want to point out on this chart, which is highly misleading, incredibly misleading, uh, because then people will say, "Yeah, but you, you know, look, look, over on the left side, there that they, they have a lot of exchange reserves because you know the the dollar has historically been the global reserve currency, but that's probably going to go away." And then they'll say, "Yeah, they've issued a lot of dollars because dollar debt because the dollar is a reserve currency, but that's going to go away." And as you move forward to the right, over to the right, you start to see the euro becoming more more in line with the dollar. And so they say, "Look, look at the look at global payments of the euro versus you know the dollar, and look at global trade invoicing versus the dollar." Well, <laughs> the problem with this chart is that when they calculate that for the euro. They're calculating inter-European transfers. Right. Yeah, that was so my, if, if, my obvious so if, thought. If, 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 Ger if Germany trades with Spain in euros, they count that as an international payment. That would that would be like us calling trade between California and Texas an international payment. And if we threw that up there, then then again the yellow would totally dominate the blue. And the same with the kind of the global trade invoicing. You know, if if, if Italy trades with uh, Belgium and it's invoiced in Europe, they call that a global trade invoicing, but it's not. It, 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 it's, it, it's the home currency. So again, the, whether you like it or not, I don't really care. The fact of the matter is, is that the dollar dominates all other currencies on a global basis on a number of different factors. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that de-dollarization isn't happening. Of course it is. Um, and of course, or, or of course, people want it to happen. I mean, is it really exactly. happening? Though? Exactly. I guess that that's the point. There's, you know, I would love to be Phil Mickelson, but I just don't hit the golf ball that way. You know, it's just 
wanting to do something and have the actual ability to do it are, are two dramatically different things. And while I think someday this will happen, we're just not there yet. And, 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 and what, what I think is going to happen is I think we're going to get into a crisis where the efforts that have been done are too little too late. It's not that the effort's not there. It's not that the intention isn't there. But again, you know, if I go out and play Phil Mickelson today, as much as I may want to beat him, I'm just not going to do it. Um, and so I think it's important to be realistic when you're allocating your portfolio of what you would like to see happen and what's actually going to happen. Um, if, if you go to the next chart, uh, you know, the, the BIS has put out a couple of reports recently, um, and, uh, you know, they're full of charts and full of information. And, and here's the crazy thing. The, the BIS probably has access to more information than anybody, and they even have trouble coming up with some of this stuff. Uh, but if you look at the chart on the far right of, of this chart that I put up, it basically shows, shows the U.S. dollar share of highly rated corporate debt. And it's basically just under 50%. So of all the highly rated corporate debt in the world, about half of it is issued in dollars. Right. And, 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 it's, and it's not just by you know, U.S. entities, right? This, 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 again, it's dominated by global, uh, global, highly rated global debt is dominated by being issued in dollars. And I, th I just think it's important to understand that. Uh, let go, me just say, yeah. I'll step in here and say that, you know, that chart in particular, of all the charts that we've seen so far, this is the first chart that I see that definitively tells me uh, to worry with regard to what you're talking about in terms of the dollar, because it looks like, you know, from the great financial crisis to today, uh, the share of the dollar in terms of corporate debt has increased. And obviously, it's not because debt in the United States is increasing only. It's because uh, other co other countries, other companies, uh, other companies domiciled outside the United States are taking up dollar-denominated debt. That's absolutely, absolutely right. And, um, you know, I think it is, you know, as as we as as these bailout so after you know March or even last year you know they started having to do more repo they reintroduced QE and and we'll we'll get into some of these slides in a little bit too is a lot of these programs even the swap lines all they do is perpetuate the current system there is nothing new has been introduced to change the system it just perpetuates it and it kicks the can down the road and the only way that the only way that kicking the can down the road works is that it makes the overall problem bigger. And so, you know, the, the swap lines that have been extended, the bailout packages that have been extended, the, the deferred payments that have been extended, you know, they don't pay your loan this month that's been extended. It just makes the problem bigger. It doesn't solve it. And so when, when, when um, well, let's go to the next slide, because I think this is important uh, mm -hmm. as well. Let's go, to the, go to the next slide, and we'll focus on the left-hand side this time. Right. Uh, you know, here, you know, a lot of times we hear about there's 12 or 13 trillion dollars of U.S. dollar debt outside the United States. Well, it's actually twice that big. You know, this or, or, or it's like 23 trillion because there's 12 trillion of, of, of dollar liabilities outside the United States issued by non-banks. Um, and then there's another nine trillion um, by non-U.S. banks. So, you know, there's this huge there's this huge uh, again, it's, it, it just speaks to the overall size of the market. It, 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 it's kind of a big deal. Now, um, we're, if, if you go to the next page, now we start to drill down into countries. And you know, I think a lot of people have seen these charts before. This isn't necessarily a new chart, but it, it's a lot of the EMs that have the majority, uh, as far, at, at least as a percent of their overall GDP. Right. You know, so Chile, Chile, Mexico, Indonesia, Argentina, Russia, you know, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Brazil. Um, China is actually relatively low uh, on this chart. It's less than five percent. But I'll, I'll get into some stuff on China in a minute, which, which shows that it's still a problem. But 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 the point is, is that you know all of these countries that have these U.S. dollar denominated loans, this is a real problem for them because with trade slowing and with growth slowing, their access to dollars um, you know becomes less. And you know, one thing I should have pointed out, if if, if we could just jump back up to the top mm -hmm. uh, really quickly, go to the second slide. Go to the second okay. slide if you can. The euro it says the euro dollar market at the top. Yeah. Okay. So the, the the point I want to make is that when you look at this market, all both of these markets operate in the same way in that they're fractional reserve lending. You know, there's a dollar deposit and then that's used as a reserve to loan new money into existence. And and you know. Fractional reserve banking exists by the extension of credit. And when you have the extension of credit, 
as long as the market keeps growing and keep moving forward, there's no problems. But when you get a credit crisis and a credit squeeze and a credit crunch and credit starts to be rolled back, that's when you start to have defaults. That's when the system starts to feed on itself. That's exactly what we saw in March. You know, people started asking for the, you know, asking for the actual dollars rather than just extending credit. They were calling credit in. And so that's the case where the, the Fed had to go in and re-collateralize the system. When the Fed or any central bank comes in and does QE, they're putting new collateral into the system. The big issue is that when, when, when we need dollars in the U.S., the Fed can provide new collateral, new dollars. When, when Europe needs new euros, the ECB can provide new euros. When Brazil needs new reals, the Brazilian central bank can provide new reals. The problem is, is that in the outside market, in the offshore dollar market, there is no entity that has jurisdiction to provide new collateral to the system. The Fed does not have jurisdiction over the offshore euro dollar market. If they did, it wouldn't have grown to the size that it is. And they really have, other than swap lines, they really have no way to get that new collateral into the system. What they can do is they can promise to provide it, and that will then scare the market into action. Well, let's let's start, you know, creating credit again. But all it does is makes the system bigger. Two, so two the questions on that. Yeah, uh, question yeah. number one is why would these uh, companies in these uh, countries actually take on this level of debt relative to the GDP of their countries? And then the second one is uh, uh, totally unrelated, but very uh, related to what you're talking about is the concept that the Fed moved first in the uh, hopes and and now potentially in in the reality that others will move later, meaning the Fed provided the liquidity for the onshore market in March. And now what we're seeing is a flush out of of cash in euros in uh, yen, but also now even in Chinese yuan. So the yeah. other central banks are because the Fed doesn't have the jurisdiction are now piling on in order to uh, create the liquidity that the Fed can't make. So those two questions, uh, maybe you could well, so, address well, yeah, those. So, so there's two things there. There's and, and I have some slides that'll address some of that in, in a little bit here, but. You know the, the 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 Fed can can provide the swap lines and and and, and you know provide the, the the guidance however you want to you know the forward guidance of what they're going to do in order to spur markets and then that has largely helped, but again they can't really get the only the only method via which they can get new dollars to the market is through swap lines and, I, and my argument is that the problem is going to be too big to be solved with swap lines. But to your point, um, you know these other central banks they can they can provide liquidity, but they can't provide dollars. Right. And but 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 now that the the, the Fed has gotten the U.S. dollar spike under control for the short term, now the other central banks are coming in and providing um, their own currency. Um, and so the 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 point that I always make is yes, the, the Fed is absolutely printing, but the rest of the world has to print too, and 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 in my opinion, they have to print even more. And not only that, but if they want swap lines, they're going to have to print their money to get the U.S. dollar swap line. Um, so, you know, it's not a situation where the Fed is printing and everybody else is being fiscally conservative. So if we jump forward a little bit, um, mm -hmm. I'll actually, well, let's... Uh, and with regard to why these companies even took on U.S. denominated debt when, you know, they weren't necessarily making revenue in U.S. dollars per se... And they needed to well, get U.S. dollars. Well, it's it, it's it, it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. Number one, if you, this goes back to the to the offshore dollar market that I was talking about. There's a huge demand for dollars outside the United States, whether you like it or not. It exists. It's a huge market. And if you if you're a company, if you're a company that's issuing debt, and let's say you're located in Indonesia, if you issue that in dollars rather than rupees. You're going to see a bigger demand for your bonds than if you. Than the, the, there's just a bigger demand for dollar bonds than there is for rupee bonds. It's just, right. it's what it is. And it's so a lower interest you, rate. And it's well. a lower and as a, because there's more demand, you get a lower interest rate. And then if 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 Indonesia is selling some of their exports and they're receiving dollars for those exports, now they've matched their dollars with their liabilities. The problem comes is when you know their economy doesn't grow. Um, the value of their currency loses value versus the dollar. And now they have to print more of their currency to buy the dollars. 
to, 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 to pay those debts and it perpetuates the, the dollar strength even more. And so you get into a situation where, where your, your, your cash flow no longer, uh, matches your, uh, matches your liability, even though they initially did it maybe to match the, the revenues of their exports. Uh, the value of the dollar debt has just gotten to the point where it's just overwhelming their local economies. And so, you know, and that, that's kind of the essence of, of my whole argument is that this has happened on a global basis. You know, you've got all this dollar debt out there. There's just not enough dollars to service all of them. And now we have this pandemic where trade isn't happening and dollars aren't flowing and it just kind of exacerbates it. But if you go to, um, if you go to slide 13 that shows the Fed, the ECB and the Bank of Japan's balance sheet as a percent of GDP. Right. Yes. So again, you know, you can't ignore that spike in, 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 by the Fed's balance sheet. It, they're absolutely, you know, they, they've lost their minds. They're printing like crazy. But, you know, so is the, but we're still trail the ECB and the Bank of Japan. Right. And so I, I would argue that as the global reserve currency, uh, you know, and because we're on a dollar standard, you know, we have the ability. And because of the huge offshore dollar market that is demand for dollars or, or, the, or the, the, where people need dollar based assets. Um, it, it would allow us to, you know, match the ECB or the BOJ before we had to worry about, uh, you know, the currency failing, as an example. And even if we did print that much, these other countries would have to print along with us. So, again, it, it, fiat currencies are relative to each other. Um, they're all crap, for lack of a better word, but, but they do trade relative to each other. And if you look at the next slide... Um, this is, I think, one of the things you were talking about. If you look at kind of the central bank balance sheet expansion as a, a you know, again, it's not just us that's printing. The other banks are, or the other central banks are going to have to print as well. And if you look at the dollar as a percent of XX, FX traded daily, we've done far less than, than Europe or Japan. So right. the idea that, so again, the idea that we're, you know, we, we're just fiscally throwing, you know, caution to the wind and everybody else is being conservative just isn't right. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, this is, this is another um, uh, chart by the Bureau Bank of International Settlements. And it shows, again, the, the Fed, the ECB, and the Bank of Japan, and it shows the projections and, and where their balance sheets as a percent of GDP could get to. And again, it shows even though ours is, incre is expected to increase dramatically, um, you know, the, 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 the Central Bank of Japan and, and Europe are, are, are making us you know, look small, so to speak. So again, it's just, it, it, it's not a U.S. only phenomenon. And then if you go, go, go to the next slide, um, this, is a, the, 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 this is a chart that, that's showing what, what Germany is going to do, um, you know, as, as a fiscal impulse and, and, and a bailout uh, or, or liquidity measure. So, you know, again, it's, it's, not, uh, it's, not that, uh, it's not that we're not doing anything we are, but you got to look around the world and understand what everybody else is doing um, because the rest of the world is doing it in spades as well. And so I think, I, I think this is very important to understand. And again, if I'm wrong, then we'll be fine because the, 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 the Fed will pro you know, provide the dollars to the market. Um, markets will function. Maybe they can kick this can down the road three or four or five years. The problem will get bigger, but in the meantime, there's a but. But until they actually change the fundamental design of the system, nothing has been fixed. And it, it, and if if the central banks can keep the plates spinning and keep the problems um, going, then like I said, it'll be like the last five years, and it, there'll be periods of of, of uh, volatility, but overall, it'll be fine. But if I'm right. And if I'm even right a little bit and we get into this scramble for dollars and the dollar spikes because of the fragility of the system and because of the size of the market and because of the opaqueness of the of the offshore market, um, some of the trades that we're doing have such asymmetry that you kind of have to do it. Because if you look at I don't have a chart. I should have put this chart up, but there's a chart. You can get it off of Bloomberg that shows like they, they've uh, they've gone around and they've. Um, you know, surveyed 30 to 40 different financial firms and global banks and financial institutions around the world of where they expect the dollar to be over the next, you know, year or two. And one of one out of 35 has it going higher. Everybody else has it going down anywhere from 5% to 10 to 15%. Um, so because what, that's what does that mean in terms of the asymmetry of how you well, can put that position on? 
Well, I, well, that's a, that's what I was going to say. And then if you also go into the, you look at the commitment of traders, and you look at the people, the speculators that are long euro. You know, it's at a, it's near its high. If you look at the, the speculators are near short, they're their record short on the dollar. The the point is, is that the asymmetry lies on being long the dollar, not short the dollar. It doesn't necessarily mean that I'm right and the dollar will go higher. It just means that that's where the edge lies, um, and the pricing of of doing some of the trades. Um, you know, that do go long the dollar and short either other assets or other currencies give you the asymmetry that you can put a small amount of money out to make a huge amount of money. And so that, that goes back to give back, an example in yeah. terms of how uh, some of the uh, viewers are thinking about this. Here's Ellen. She asked a little while ago, uh, what instrument do you see, do you use in the milkshake fund to express your views, spot, futures, options, et cetera? W what exactly would you use? Mainly, mainly all of the above. <laughs> we we have so our fund is very concentrated by theme, but it's very diversified by geography. It's very diversified by security, and it's very diversified by uh, political jurisdiction. So, in other words, we have trades in Asia, you know, Europe, um, North America, South America, the Middle East. Um, Sometimes, in in some cases, we're we're short currencies, and some and we're doing it through the futures market. In some cases, we have options on those currencies. Uh, in some cases, those options are listed. In some cases, they're not. Um, but so, so we we have a very diversified way of of playing this this market. And and again, if 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 we get it right, we have the opportunity uh, to, to 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 do very well. You know, one of the the trades that we did last year that was one of our big winners was we thought that the as the global economy slowed and as the dollar got stronger, it would put extreme pressure on Canada. And so Canada had been touting a strong monetary policy. They were the last major central bank not to cut. And they were saying that they didn't think they were going to have to cut. So we, we thought that was completely wrong. And so we tried to figure out what's the best way to play this. And what we decided to do was we went out and bought call options on short-term Canadian bonds, for lack of a better word. And so when the Bank of Canada started to cut aggressively this year, you know, the the the, the short-term bonds went up dramatically and the call options that we bought kind of went through the roof. Um, and so that was a way to put out a little bit of money and make a, and make a lot. Um, and if we're wrong, we don't lose that much. But if we're right, you know, we kind of make this asymmetric return. So right. again, that, 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 that's kind of, and, and when, when I look at the overall portfolio, again, I don't think anybody, and we haven't had any clients allocate more than, you know, most of them put between five and 10% of their portfolio into the the dollar hedge strategy, for lack of a better word. Again, if, if we get it right, that five percent has the chance to become a big part of the overall portfolio. If we're wrong, it doesn't kill them. Um, and, you know, that is interesting when you talk about the dollar hedge because I'm thinking of it in terms of uh, investors from various uh, jurisdictions where they have to hedge back into whatever uh, currency that they're going. So. You know what would be uh, the difference between someone who's a U.S. dollar-based uh, client and someone who's like a euro-based client in terms yeah. of how you, they would be thinking about using that uh, that dollar position? Yeah. Well, well, the interesting thing is we we've uh, about sixty percent of our clients are U.S. domestic, and, and we have an offshore version of the fund as well. And so about forty percent of our clients are from offshore, and it, we denominate everything in dollars, so the returns are based in dollars and stuff. But we think it actually makes even more sense for or people from other countries, because, you know, if if you are, let's say you're an Australian dollar investor, and uh, and we do have some Australian investors, and so if they come in and they invest, and let's say the, this is as an example, let's pretend the fund goes up twenty percent, um, but if at the same time the Australian dollar falls ten percent, they're actually up thirty percent, right? Um, so not only are we are we not only do we think we're going to make a very high return in dollars. Uh, but versus the foreign currencies that we're betting against in the fund, we think it's going to actually accentuate and kind of put a turbocharge on the fund. And again, it's 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 kind of one of these things where if you don't think I'm right, that's fine. But if you think I might be right, the asymmetry is there that you kind of have to do that. Like we all see trades that, you know, you see a trade, oh, that wouldn't be a bad trade. You can do that trade or maybe we'll make money there. And then you see other trades. Well, you know what? It could work, but you probably shouldn't do it. The risk is just too high. And for the potential return. But then sometimes you see a trade where even if you don't necessarily think it's going to work, if it might work, if the asymmetry is such, you kind of just need to do the trade. Just Bitcoin's a perfect example, right? Like Bitcoin, maybe Bitcoin works, maybe it doesn't. But if it works, it's going much, much higher. 
And so it's a way to put out a little bit of money to make a very high return. So it's kind of a similar concept. Right. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, let me give you a few more questions that we have that people are asking. I think this is interesting. Uh, it's very similar to the question that Ellen was asking. Noah Rogers is saying, you know, would leverage currency ETFs be a reasonable way to play the milkshake for U.S. sub $2 million lumpen pola, he calls it, uh, the, the proletariat? Uh, what would yeah. you recommend? So this this is really hard to answer, and I'm actually glad somebody asked it because I get asked this on Twitter all the time. And you know, the the, the long answer is I I can't give advice over Twitter. I, I can't tell you specifically what trades to do over over a real vision interview. I can just tell you that you, you have to. I I think that the U.S. dollar is going to go up a lot over the next couple of years. We set up the fund so that we could do it with securities that were not ETFs. Quite honestly. Um, the trades that we're doing are very hard to do in a regular retail individual account. Um, you know, I think if you're going to try to replicate these trades in a, in, a, in, a, in a retail account, just make sure you size it correctly. Don't risk more than you can afford to lose, especially if you're using leverage. Um, I would rec, I, I, you know, I, I can just say that I, I would recommend being long U.S. dollar assets versus short the assets from around the rest of the world. And how you decide to employ that is really up to you. And I'm not trying to duck the question. I, I'd happily answer it, but I have well, a certain fiduciary. Let me put the fiduciary. question a different way, because I, I, I think I that your answer is interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, let, say that someone has a, a position that Europe will outperform the United States on a non-currency basis. Uh, but obviously, then when you add in the currency, they could underperform. Uh, you know, you have two possibilities. You hedge out the currency risk or... Uh, you uh, you do some sort of optionality. I mean, because a lot of the things that you were talking about in terms of the asymmetry are saying that, you know, I'm thinking of it in terms of a a, a, a call or an out of the money play of some sort that that you know, uh, as you move towards the strike price of uh, of the U.S. dollar going higher, you know, you get a, a lot of leverage out of that play, and therefore, uh, you know, you've only put a very small amount down. But it has enough of a return profile that it, uh, it it overrides all of the other parts of your portfolio. Exactly, exactly. And then you know, and then, like I said, unfortunately, I, just, I I can't give a general answer because it, again, everybody's different. Everybody has different needs and wants and risk tolerances, et cetera, et cetera. I would just say that if you're going to do it in a leveraged way in an individual you know retail account, uh, just make sure you know what you're doing and that you size the the trade appropriately. Yeah, you know, um, let's talk about the macro background that would make this uh, actionable in, in the near term. Uh, you know, I'm going to play it from the devil's advocate perspective sure. uh, it, it, with regard to, let's say, that the Fed has done enough. Uh, the, here would be, here's a, a macro view. You could say that the Fed had a liquidity crisis. They stomped it out in March. Uh, but, you know, there was still some economic pain to come. We're seeing that in Q2. Maybe we'll see it in Q3 as well, both here in the United States and elsewhere, especially when you have the reopening uh, causing a viral contagion. But, uh, you know, this is only a, 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 a small window. And the fiscal power that you put forward that you had in that slide with Germany in particular, you know, going full out, maxing out. Will be enough to uh, prevent a, a debt deflation, and as a result of that, you could have a recurrence of the 2009 scenario where you have weak uh, nominal growth, but enough to continue to uh, you know be able to play that out over a longer period of time. W would that be a dollar bearish scenario, and is that potentially what people are saying they think is going to happen? Yeah, so I, I get that argument a lot, and I, listen, I can't really that that's possible. It's maybe the central banks can keep the plates spinning longer, right? Maybe they can print enough money and do enough fiscal stimulus that they can kick this can down the road another year or two. Um, but I think the point I would, and, and actually that is part of the reason. Well, a lot of times people ask me how long I think this is going to take to play take to plays out, and I always say it's going to take two or three years. And and I don't have to. I I can lose money for the next year. And still have plenty. Of, we have, we have lots of cash in the portfolio, and the, the the asymmetry of the trades is such that we can put a little bit out in order to make a lot. So if we don't make money in the next year, it's really okay because we're thinking of this over a two to three year time period, right? 
I don't know if it'll play out over the next year. I think it will over the next two to three, but I don't know if it'll play out over the next year. And so if the central banks and the monetary authorities are able to push it down the road, and maybe we get some, you know, dollar weakness between now and the election or next spring. And, you know, there's these green shoots of global growth that have propped up every, you know, two or three years for the last 12. I can't rule that out. But what I do know, what I do know is that all of this can kicking does is it makes the overall problem bigger. And I know that nothing has been done to solve the underlying problem. And so until they, until I actually see concrete action to, to, to solve the underlying problem, I'm more than happy to keep, you know, laying out these asymmetric bets over the next two or three years, because when the when the when the time comes for the payoff, the payoff will be such that it will be will have been worth, you know, waiting. You know, gold or Bitcoin are both good examples. You know, gold was in a seven year bear market, but it's starting to pay off. You know, and I think the people who held for that seven years, they're glad they own gold now, right? Or the the, the miners or whatever it is. Same with Bitcoin. Bitcoin went through several rallies and several troughs, and you know. I, you know, the, the, the upside of these asymmetric plays, if you if, if if you size it correctly so that it doesn't wipe you out in the meantime, it makes sense to have a portion of your portfolio to some of these asymmetric plays uh, because uh, the, the insurance quality aspect of it paying off when you need it most is really important. Right. As an example, let's just say that you, 98% of your portfolio was allocated to uh, your your normal 60-40 um, or whatever it might be yeah. type of yeah. uh, thing. 2% is allocated to the strategy that you're talking about with an asymmetry of 10 to 1. So potentially 20% yeah. upside, but you know 2%. You could potentially yeah, take- Yeah, you could lose it all. Right. Yeah. But yeah. still, nonetheless, uh, you're saying that that asymmetry is worth it in terms of it being able to play out over a discrete period exactly. of time. Exactly. And, my, you know, you know, another good example is let's look at uh, 2006 to 2010 time frame. You know, there was a lot of people who put the big short trade on in 2005, 2006, 2007. And, you know, they, they timed it wrong. They were just too early. Right. Right. Uh, you know, but the Mark Hart's and the Kyle Basses and the John Paulson's, they, they timed it a little bit better. Uh, it was essentially the same trade. They didn't do, you know, the, they did the same analysis that the guys that came before them did and came to the same conclusion, but they timed it better. And, you know, when it paid off, you know, you know, they, they I think in their first year, they were probably down 20, 30, 40, 50%, you know, as those CDS uh, contracts or whatever, those, those derivatives went against them. But when it paid off, it didn't pay off a little bit, right? They didn't, they didn't make 20% when it paid off. They made, you know, 2000% or, right. or whatever the number, whatever the number was. And yeah, I think if you ask any of those people, they'd be happy to make that trade again, you know, suffer those drawdowns over the short term in order to make the big home run in the long term. Again, if you've sized the trade appropriately, if you're, if you're worth $10 million and you put 10 million into it and it doesn't work out, well, that's not very smart, right? right. Uh, but you know, if you're worth $10 million and you can afford to dribble one or 2% out over the next two or three years, I don't know why you wouldn't do it. Yeah, let, let me uh, get to some of these questions because I think you have a hard stop at three fifteen. Is that right? I do. Yeah, I've got about ten more minutes. Okay, okay. so uh, I already have like uh, five questions that have built up here. So let me see if we can uh, get through some of them. Here is one from Dwayne Pettis, and he's asking: uh, The U.S. had significant inflation and, and a decline in the dollar in the nineteen seventies. We were the reserve currency of the world back then too. What makes today different? Uh, than the U, uh, that the U.S. is immune to such a situation. Okay, so there's two parts. Of it. First of all, the U.S. is not immune to the situation. The U.S. is in big trouble, and the U.S. is going to pay a price for it. So I, I would not say that we're immune. The difference today is that there's a lot more dollar debt in the world. It's not issued only by the United States. The rest of the world is also in debt. In the 1970s, they weren't in as bad a situation as they are in today, and they didn't have a large amount of debt issued in a currency other than their own. And you know, also back in the 70s, um, you know, there were still kind of the vestiges of the, of the gold standard. You know, we had left the gold standard, but you know, the, the central banks still held gold. Uh, it was a bigger percent of their overall reserves. Um, that's not again that that that's not the case today either. And so you've got a situation where fiat currencies trade relative to each other. If you pick 10 fiat currencies, you can look at all 10 of them and say they're all horrible, and I will agree with you. But it's a mathematical certainty that one of them will fall last. 
Right. right? They, 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 trade, the dollar. They, they trade in relation to each other. They just do. You don't have to like it, but you just have to understand that they all trade relative to each other. So well, I think when, you know, as we go into this, uh, you know, this currency crisis and this, you know, this uh, global storm, for lack of a better word, because, again, the whole world's in it. I think that the U.S. versus the other currencies will do well. Now, it may go down versus gold. It may go down versus some other hard assets that you own. I, I, I can't guarantee that it's going to retain its purchasing power. But relative to other currencies, I think the dollar is going to dramatically outperform them. And that is where the asymmetry lies. That is what, because nobody thinks that's going to happen, that's where you can get the good bets. That's where you get the good odds. And um, that is why I continue to pound it. And that's why I've said for years that the dollar and gold will go up together. People say that can't happen. They're, they're, they're the antithesis of each other. And my point is, if you're just looking at those two, then yes, they're the antithesis of it. But if you look at the whole world, those two assets can rise versus everything else. And I think that they will. You know, uh, uh, there's another question very much related to what you're saying. TJ is asking, uh, where does Brent see the dollar in the very short term? Uh, I don't know if this is something that you think about, but he also asked around, say, the next few months. So I think the next few months are, quite, honestly, it's a toss-up. I, I could see the dollar going lower. I could go higher. The, the big wild card out there that I see is that the Treasury has built up a large amount of cash in their general account. And typically, when they spend that amount of cash, that's that that's that's dollar weakness. Typically, that floods the economy with uh, you know liquidity. Dollar pressure comes down, the dollar falls. So that that that's that's totally possible. If that happens, I'll 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 double down on our bets because the, the terms will be even better. Right. Um, and because because I know the overall solution hasn't been fixed. The other thing that I would say is that um, you know between now and the election, it, it's kind of a toss up because. I, there's a lot of these, you know, programs that were implemented in in March and April that are going to start rolling off over the next month or two. Um, there, we've going to we're going to be into the heart of the election. Um, you know, your Trump versus the Democrats, and you know, some they're they're going to be arguing for stimulus bills, but they'll, you know, I have a hard time believing that the Democrats are going to give Trump what he wants leading up to the election. You know, like it or not, uh, if, if the economy is in bad shape. You know that's less likely that Trump gets elected. So I, I don't think the the Democrats are going to want him to have you know markets at all time high, leading into the election. The other thing that I think is kind of interesting is that you know it was a year or so ago one of the Fed governors, I think it was the New York Fed governor, said something to the fact that maybe we should use monetary policy to to get rid of Trump. Right. You know, yes, that was which, the which, ex, which, which, uh, New York which, Fed, which, the yeah. Goldman guy, right? Right. Which was very controversial because you know the Fed is supposed to be apolitical; they're not supposed right. to be political. But here was one of the Fed governors arguing for maybe we should be political. Well, now you're getting into a situation where if the markets start to get weak again prior to the prior to the election, and if the after everything they've done, if they didn't come out and do more, it could almost be viewed as them being political. Right. right. Yes. And they, um, they try to go against that. Right. Because they don't right. want to be seen as political. So I guess the, the long story short is I don't know what's going to happen between now and the election. I, I think it could go easily. It would not surprise me if we wake up next week and the dollars above 100. It wouldn't surprise me if you wake up next week and the dollars below 95. It's just I don't know the short term. I just know that the problem hasn't been fixed, that the problem is incredibly large, and I don't think they have the tools to fix it. And so whether this happens this month, next month, or next year, I don't know. I just know I'm going to be here when it does. And if you go to the very last slide that I, that I sent, Ed, mm -hmm. uh, this, is, this is kind of hard to see, but it basically shows the, the reaction of, of the U.S. dollar um, and, and foreign currencies um, when you, in, in flight to safety episodes. Right. And, and, it yes. and it basically shows that the dollar increases when you get flight to safety episodes. And they use both 9-11 um, terrorist attack and, you know, Lehman going bankrupt as examples. It, My argument is, what do you think about the Swiss franc and the Japanese yen in those scenarios? So I think the I think the Swiss franc, if I had to choose one currency other than the U.S., it would probably be the Swiss franc. Um I don't like the yen. I think the yen is going to get crushed. Maybe in the short term, they might rally versus all these other EMs. But I, I think eventually the, the yen is going to go to 150, maybe dramatically higher than that. Um, because I think I think when this all plays out, we, we get this spike in the dollar and it just kind of, uh, you know, 
uh, you know, it just kind of knocks out all these other currencies. I think it's a domino effect. But but my but my point with this slide here was that unless it's different this time, the dollar is going to get stronger the next time we have an, uh, a liquidity crisis or an event. And I think that this because the system hasn't been fixed, we're going to have another crisis. We're going to have another event. And whether it's like uh, whether it's like Lehman, whether it's like uh, in March, I, I don't know. I just know that all the pieces are there. Uh, for that when we have the, this next event, whether it's COVID related or something else, that the dollar is set to go much, much higher. Now, uh, well, another question we have here, I'm just watching the time, Luis yep. Pinto, he's asking, of all the EMFX against the US dollar, where yep. do you see the most asymmetry? Uh, um, I would say Hong Kong first and probably either Turkey or Brazil second. Right, very good. Uh, another question here is from Pablo Seferian. He's asking, how do I buy into your fund? <laughs> uh, so send me an email, brent at santiagocapital.com, and uh, we can go from there. Excellent. Now, here's a question I have for you. This is another, another devil's advocate. Uh, maybe this will take us to the 315 mark. I'm going to try to make it as quickly as possible. Yep. The one thing I saw, the, the chart that I saw that was the most uh, aggravating was the one about you know, the percentage of D GDP of these countries that these debt-denominated uh, uh, companies had, Chile and Mexico, uh, followed by Turkey. Now, yep. what I found interesting as I was uh, thinking about it is maybe what if a, uh, Mexico, as an example, can get these swap lines in long enough for them to refinance their debt into local currency before the event happens so that that number goes significantly down? Would that be a positive for that particular currency uh, well, I, area? It, it would. It, it could potentially be a positive if their economy was really strong and we weren't going into what I perceive to be a global slowdown. But you got to understand, it's not. It would not be easy for Mexico to totally switch their to refinance all their money into pesos. There, 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 there would likely not be the demand for it, right? I mean, the reason that they issue in dollars is that there's there's demand for it, and the interest rate is lower. The if, if they were to refinance it all in pesos. Uh, the interest rate would be higher, and they might have difficulty actually, you know, doing it. But you know, when so, I think of the swap yeah. lines that the the uh, U.S. Oh, yeah. government has with so-called emerging markets, Mexico comes up first as the one yeah. that has the you know primacy in terms yeah. of access that might be able to, and they're the ones who are the yeah. second in line in terms of you know USD denominated debt. So mm -hmm. that's where the rubber hits the road in many ways. Oh, and I'm getting from my uh, my uh, producer here that I have to wrap that up. So if you give yeah, me like yeah. a 10 or 15 second, because I know you have to go. Yeah, listen, if, if if I saw concrete actions being taken place by these countries around the world who have this dollar debt as a way to solve it, then I, I will obviously consider it. Uh, I don't think it's going to be possible for them to pull it off. And so and because the asymmetry is there, I'm happy to bet against it. If I'm wrong, I lose a little bit. And if I'm right, I make a lot. That's a great way to end it. Brent, I'm sorry we hit, ran out of time, but uh, we'll have to have you back and talk about it a little bit more. Really appreciate it and uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.